<laughs> I've never competed against a heat wave before. Uh, for people's attention for the history talk. But thank you all for coming along in this this glorious day. Uh, and I want to thank Jason for the, the title in the in the printout. It's brilliant. Frederick Douglass in Ireland with Donald Fallon. It's my traverse around the island of Ireland with Frederick Douglass uh, in the mid 19th century. And I wish I had because. This is an incredible story. Uh, one of the things I love about the Linen Hall Library as a space is it does so much to, to talk about the kind of intersections of different histories and the idea of shared history. And when it comes to shared history, this story is remarkable. I mean, this is the story of an American Methodist who befriends the leader of Catholic Ireland, Daniel O'Connell, who is largely hosted as he travels around Ireland by Quakers, Unitarians and Methodists uh, in the anti-slavery movement. The, variety of people that Frederick Douglass meets uh, in Ireland in the 1840s, absolutely staggering, as are the variety of places in which he speaks. I mean, when you travel around the island today, you find memorials to Frederick Douglass everywhere, plaques in Waterford and Limerick and Cork, uh, most recently uh, in Dublin, plans for the statue here in Belfast. It's an incredible story. Uh, one dimension of it that I think is very interesting is that Douglass doesn't travel into the west of Ireland. And of course, the broader context of what's happening in Ireland at the time, 1845, 1846, on Gertemore, the Great Hunger, uh, it's extraordinary that Douglas didn't see that firsthand in the west of Ireland, where it was most pronounced. But still, I think his observations uh, on the island that he did visit are very interesting. And today, we're going to be primarily driven by Douglas's own words, by his recollections of Ireland, and also by the accounts of people who attended his lectures. Uh, this story has made its way into literature. Uh, I meet people all the time, visitors to Dublin, who have read Colin McCann's great book, Transatlantic, in 2013. And Colin really beautifully dramatised the story of Frederick Douglass in Ireland. He talks about his arrival uh, in Dublin. Dawn unlocked the morning in increments of grey. The rope tightened hard against the bollard. The water slapped against Kingstown Pier. He stepped off the gangplank, 27 years old. In a black grey coat and a wide grey scarf, his hair worn high and parted. The cobbles were wet, horses breathed steam into the September mist. Douglas carried his own leather trunk to the waiting carriage. He was not yet used to being waited upon. Douglas was 27 years of age at the time he first set foot on Irish soil. I think for many people, the first they heard about Frederick Douglas in Ireland uh, was the visit of Barack Obama in 2011. It was an extraordinary week, uh, Barack Obama and Queen Elizabeth II in Dublin within days of each other. And on College Green, Barack Obama spoke uh, outside the old Irish Parliament. The speech began very sort of cheesy. He said, you know, Barack Obama of the long lost money gall Obamas and have come to find the missing apostrophe in the name Obama. And I thought, oh, this is terrible stuff. You know? <laughs> then, it got, then it got more serious. Uh, and he really focused in on a speech on the visit of Frederick Douglass to Ireland. Obama told us, Frederick Douglass, an escaped slave and our great abolitionist, forged an unlikely friendship right here in Dublin with your great liberator, Daniel O'Connell. His time here, Frederick Douglass said, defined him not as a colour, but as a man, and it strengthened the non-violent campaign he would return home to wage. And I really think since that visit in 2011, uh, and since that speech, Obama really focused in on the nature of the relationship between Daniel O'Connell and Frederick Douglass. There's much more familiarity with the story of Douglass. Most of the plaques across the island have actually gone up since 2011. So when we're looking at Douglas in Ireland, there's supposed to be key themes in this. Uh, where, did, where did Irish anti-slavery politics come from? And, you know, history has really focused on the meeting of Frederick Douglass and Daniel O'Connell. But what we'll see today, actually, is that it was a network of Quakers, Unitarians, Presbyterians that was very much at the heart of the anti-slavery movement uh, across the island of Ireland. It's extraordinary that Douglas one day could be sharing a platform with someone like Father Theobald Matthew, you know, the Catholic priest of temperance, Ireland sober will be Ireland free. And then a few days later, he's speaking in a Presbyterian hall in Belfast. Like he really meets uh, all Irish life while he's here. We should ask ourselves too, what was the influence of Ireland on Frederick Douglass? Did it shape his thinking politically? Uh, did it shape his approach to politics? I mean, you look at someone like Daniel O'Connell, who was known as the, the king of the beggars, and whose political strength was in his ability to mobilize masses of people. You know, how did that make Douglas think about politics and how he could bring about change? And then as was well in conclusion, what was the lasting impact of this visit? Uh, did it encourage an Irish anti-slavery movement uh, going forward? It's worth saying Douglas was not the first anti-slavery voice 
uh, to speak in Ireland. There's a long history of abolitionists and anti-slavery campaigners visiting Dublin. Uh, the great Equiano was here uh, in 1791, a former slave born in present-day Nigeria. Uh, he arrives in Ireland at a very dramatic time, you know, the 1790s, when the political atmosphere in Ireland is changing very much so in the aftermath of the American and French revolutions. Uh, Equiano remembered that in May 1791, I sailed from Liverpool to Dublin, where I was very kindly received, and from thence to Cork, and then travelled over many counties in Ireland. I was everywhere exceedingly well treated by persons of all ranks. Just like Frederick Douglass, uh, Equiano had written an account uh, of his life I suppose, and, and his escape from slavery that was a, a great seller in the late 18th century. He recorded Belfast, and this is interesting, as the city where he found the people most hospitable uh, and most open to his message. He lodged in Belfast, Equiano, with Samuel Nielsen, a prominent figure in the society of United Irishmen. And his biographer talks about Nielsen as someone who brought the excitement caused by the French Revolution into Irish focus, putting public dissatisfaction into words and gathering the forces necessary for uh, revolt. When Equiano was in Ireland, they published an Irish edition of his memoir uh, in Dublin, uh, supported by many prominent United Irishmen, including James Napper Tandy, a leading trade unionist in Dublin. So in the 1790s, the anti-slavery message begins to take hold in Ireland in a significant way. That's a great illustration of Bastille Day in Belfast in 1792. Famously, uh, anti-slavery banners are carried through the streets of Belfast uh, on those Bastille Day uh, festivities. And Belfast is very much the epicenter of anti-slavery activism from the 1790s on in Ireland. Thomas Russell, librarian here at the Belfast Society for Promoting Knowledge uh, and a prominent United Irishman, have been influential in organising boycotts of tainted goods in the 1790s. Uh, his biographer tells us that he refused to consume sugar or rum. Anti-slavery activism continued in this city, especially even after the United Irish Movement. Uh, though sometimes still linked to it. You know, in the early 19th century in Belfast, uh, the site of Mary Ann McCracken leafleting in Belfast stocks against slavery is one of the folk memories of 19th century Belfast. So it's not like people in Ireland aren't aware of you know, the anti-slavery cause or aware of abolition before Frederick Douglass comes to Ireland. There is a long history of speakers before him. The organisation that are most prominently involved in, in bringing Douglas here, the brilliantly named Hibernian Anti-Slavery Society, uh, born in Dublin in the 1830s. Uh, Dublin Quaker Richard Allen, shown here. Uh, the Quaker Richard D. Webb and James Houghton, who was a Unitarian but came from a Quaker family. Uh, these guys were essentially involved in every decent social reform movement in 1830s Dublin to such an extent that they were denounced by a political rival. He called them the anti-everything Aryans. <laughs> they were against everything. They were pacifists, they were teetotalers, they were abolitionists. Uh, some of them were vegetarians. I mean, they were very unique uh, supporters of women's suffrage, amongst other things. They certainly stood out in 19th century Dublin. But it's the Hibernian anti-slavery society that are at the heart of the movement to bring Douglas here. Uh, they were very, very active. And significantly, I think what's important about them, of course, slavery was an issue within the British Empire too. And a lot of anti-slavery activism uh, in these islands had really focused on that, had focused on removing slavery as part of life in the British Empire. But the Dublin abolitionists from very early on, uh, they expressed some massive interest in American slavery. I think that's because so many of them were Quakers. You know, they saw themselves as part of a kind of transatlantic community. And the Quakers in America were very active in anti-slavery politics. I think that had a big impact on the anti-slavery movement uh, in Ireland. They were very respected. They attended the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London in 1840. The brilliant surviving illustration uh, of the anti-slavery convention. And two of the things that I noticed about it, one, it's overwhelmingly white, uh, and two, it's overwhelmingly male. There have been great debates over whether you know, female abolitionists shouldn't even be able to attend the convention, never mind uh, speak out. But it was a very significant moment nonetheless. In 1840, this gathering in London of leading abolitionists, and Ireland was well represented 
uh, in the gathering. Daniel O'Connell, MP, uh, was there. O'Connell was already a well-known name amongst abolitionists all over the world. In 1832, he had famously said, I am for speedy, immediate abolition. I care not what caste, creed, or color slavery may assume. I am for its total, instant abolition. Whether it be personal or political, mental or corporal, intellectual or spiritual, I am for its immediate abolition. I enter into no compromise with slavery. Uh, that's very important, that statement, because you know some of the men who attend the anti-slavery convention in London, some of them argue, or oh, maybe there can be a gradual removal of slavery. You know, we need to compensate slave owners in, in some way. We need to convince them uh, towards an abolitionist approach. O'Connell doesn't buy that. You know, O'Connell believes in its immediate abolition and nothing short thereof. Uh, Daniel O'Connell's reputation amongst Irish nationalists and, and, and Republicans has always been divisive. James Connolly, in his uh, Labour history, uh, uh, Labour history of Ireland, uh, Connolly was very dismissive of Daniel O'Connell. And in fact, one of his chapters was called Daniel O'Connell and the Working Class, a chapter of horrors. Uh, he didn't take much of O'Connell's attitudes towards trade unionism, but Connolly and others could always admit, looking back, that Daniel O'Connell's very principled stand against slavery was something that set him apart from many others. Uh, the American abolitionists loved O'Connell. They were very aware of him. Uh, the famous abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, who was a great supporter of Frederick Douglass and nourished Douglass towards the stage, uh, he remembered being there when O'Connell spoke in London in 1840, and he talked about he was received with a storm of applause that almost shook the building to its foundations. In some ways, O'Connell was the father of you know, mass politics, as we know it. Uh, his 19th century meetings, uh, known as monster rallies uh, in pursuit of political reform, in Ireland, that was also something that the American abolitionists were very influenced by, the idea of taking the peasantry, if you will, uh, and, and marching them in pursuit of political change. Because politics before that was something wealthy men did, not before. And O'Connell was known as the king of the beggars. Uh, the monster rally was sometimes attended by hundreds of thousands of people. It must have been an incredible thing to watch a rally like that. You know, when you think about it, in a time before modern day transportation, without the use of a single hashtag, uh, without a PA system, to bring 750,000 people to one place and try and address them all is incredible. But I wonder how the message sounded when we got to the back. Uh, they often happened at places of deep historical symbolism, like the Hill of Tara. And yeah, American abolitionists were very aware of O'Connell and what he was doing in Ireland. So William Lloyd Garrison, like many of the famous abolitionists uh, in America, is white. He's a primary influence over Frederick Douglass. Uh, he is in correspondence with Frederick Douglass all the time when Douglass is traveling through Ireland uh, and Britain. He often reprints O'Connell's speeches in his newspaper, which is called The Liberator. And The Liberator uh, was a, a name bestowed upon Daniel O'Connell. I've always wondered if that was a nod in O'Connell's direction. Uh, he kind of used O'Connell's words trying to shame Irish Americans. There was a problem in sections of Irish America with racism. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison kind of threw the words of O'Connell at Irish America, you know, uh, trying to draw them into the anti-slavery movement and to make them think. The man who shouts for a repeal, he says, talking about Ireland, and yet is willing to shake hands with a southern slaveholder is a loathsome hypocrite and stands en masse in his true character before an impartial universe. O'Connellism we might call it that. I love this statue. This is the statue at the top of O'Connell Street in Dublin. Uh, and it's Hibernia, Britannia's younger sister. <laughs> She's holding the act of Catholic emancipation in her hand. She's pointing up at Daniel O'Connell as if to say, this is the man who achieved it. She's standing on the road in chains and there's a bishop pointing at the act of Catholic emancipation. It's interesting that within the anti-slavery movement, there were very different views uh, towards Daniel O'Connell. Uh, the relationship between O'Connell, who was not only a Catholic, he was the leader of Catholic Ireland, and the liberal Protestant anti-slavery activists in Ireland it could be a curious thing. You know, they often agreed on slavery, but didn't necessarily agree on the path forward uh, for Ireland. Richard D. Webb, for example, one of the Hibernian anti-slavery uh, society founders, was to a 
significant enough extent publicly hostile to Daniel O'Connell uh, on the question of Ireland, believing that you know, it could lead the O'Connell movement to an Ireland ruled by the most bigoted, priest-ridden form of Christianity. But at the same time, Webb recognised the importance of O'Connell and the issue of slavery. And these words from O'Connell became particularly famous. I want no American aid if it comes across the Atlantic stained with Negro blood. And from my soul, I despise any government which, while it boasts of liberty, is guilty of slavery, the greatest crime that can be committed by humanity against humanity. Immediately before Frederick Douglass, uh, Charles Lennox Remond arrives in Ireland in 1841. Uh, interestingly, he's, he's a free man, uh, though he's a black American. And when he returns home uh, from Ireland, he brings with him an address of the Irish people to their countrymen and countrywomen in America, which was signed by the Lord Mayor of Dublin by Daniel O'Connell uh, and others. So, you know, Equiano is in the late 18th century. There was still some memory of Equiano, but Charles Lennox Remond is in Ireland right before uh, Frederick Douglass. And he's so moved by Daniel O'Connell that he says, no nation or people possess a superior to Daniel O'Connell as a political advocate. He does a lot of the same route that uh, Frederick Douglass will do. He speaks in Dublin, he speaks in Limerick, he speaks in Cork, and he speaks here uh, in Belfast. Uh, the crowd that attend his lecture in Belfast, Charles Lennox Remond, have described as crowded and fashionable, which is brilliant. Uh, he speaks in the home in Belfast of John Edgar, a Presbyterian minister. Uh, and it's interesting just to see the differences, I suppose, in who's the backbone of an anti-slavery movement in different cities. The room, uh, the newsletter complained, was literally crammed. And indeed, the committee in selecting such a room seemed to have but little idea of the interest which the Belfast public in general take in the rights and liberties of the poor slave. Interestingly, this plaque in Limerick that honors Frederick Douglass also mentions other speakers who passed through uh, on the abolition circuit, including Charles Lennox. Right. So Frederick Douglass, who arrives in Ireland four years after Charles Lennox Remond, he looks exactly like this at the time, because this is from his book. Uh, his fantastic success of a book, which is the very reason he finds himself in Ireland. Ireland is the beginning of what will be a two-year lecture tour. Uh, he had just written Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave. It's an amazing book. It's a fantastic book. In fact, when the book came out, some people questioned in the States, you know, some pro-slavery voices actually questioned, could someone who was raised in slavery have produced the book as good as this? There was a real sense that this uh, was written by someone else. But Douglas had taught himself uh, to read and write. He later insisted knowledge is the pathway from slavery to freedom. He escaped from captivity in 1838, made his way to New York City. But when you read the book, it's stunning. The language is fantastic on freedom. I've often been asked how I felt when first I found myself on free soil, and my readers may share the same curiosity. There is scarcely anything in my experience about which I could not give a more satisfactory answer. A new world opened upon me. If life is more than breath and a quick round of blood, I lived more in one day than in a year of my slave life. It was a time of joyous excitement, which words can but tamely describe. In a letter written to a friend soon after I reached New York, I said, I felt as one might feel upon escape from a den of hungry lions, anguish and grief like darkness and rain might be depicted, but gladness and joy, like the rainbow, defy the skill of pen or pencil. The conclusion of the book remains, I think, one of the great moments of memoir ever end. Sincerely and earnestly hoping that this little book may do something towards throwing light on the American slave system and hastening the glad day of deliverance to the millions of my brethren in bonds faithfully relying upon the power of truth, love, and justice for success in my humble efforts and solemnly pledging myself anew to the sacred cause. I subscribe myself, Frederick Douglass, Massachusetts, April 28, 1845, the end. Douglass had escaped from captivity, and had numerous siblings that were still living in captivity. Uh, and there was a sense, I think, that the success of this book 
could bring negative attention onto him, that his you know, so-called master uh, could seek his return. And William Lloyd Garrison and others kind of encouraged Douglas to get out uh, for a period of time, to take this tour on the speaking circuit uh, to bring it to Britain. So the timeline's incredible. Like this is an this is an, an unbelievable speaking tour. Like he's up and down the island of Ireland. He's in Dublin on the 21st of August, 1845. Lectures in Dublin right through September, like all the time. He's speaking nearly daily in Dublin in September 1845. Down to Wexford on the 7th of October, speaks in Wexford, onto Waterford on the 9th. He's in Cork, spent a long time in Cork. Very strong Quaker community in Cork at the time. Uh, from the 11th of October to the 3rd of November, he's in Limerick from the 10th of November to the 21st. And then he's in Belfast uh, from the 5th of December through to the 12th, speaks um, in Rosemary Street Presbyterian Church, amongst other venues. He goes back, uh, he goes to Liverpool and Birmingham, but quickly comes back on the 19th of December to Belfast. He lectures uh, in, in Lisburn Presbyterian Church. Uh, he, on New Year's Eve, is talking to a total abstinence league. That's one movement that's very close to his heart, and he often talks uh, around, around that movement too. Uh, and then he's back again throughout the summer of 1846, a long series of lectures in Belfast. The Methodist Chapel in Donegal Place, for example. Uh, he speaks on the 13th of July, 1846, at the First Presbyterian Church in Bangor. So I think that... The visit, the timeline of Douglas in Ireland is extraordinary. You know, this isn't uh, a week around the island of Ireland. This is four months uh, departing to Britain and then a return and a continuation through the summer uh, of 1846. He writes very movingly to William Lloyd Garrison about Ireland. Uh, when he's just arrived, he tells him, 11 days and a half gone, and I've crossed 3,000 miles of the perilous deep. Instead of a democratic government, I'm under a monarchical, a monarchical government. Instead of the bright blue sky of America, I'm covered with the soft gray fog of the Emerald Isle. I breed and lo, the chattel becomes a man. I gaze around in vain for one who will question my equal humanity, claims me as a slave or offers me an insult. When I employ a cab, I'm seated beside white people. I reach the hotel, I enter the same door, I'm shown into the same parlor. I dine at the same table, and no one is offended. I find myself regarded and treated at every turn with the kindness and deference paid to white people. Uh, that's an image of Dublin, uh, of Douglas in the 1840s as a young man. Richard D. Webb is the man who organizes most of the speaking engagements uh, around Ireland. He's one of the Hibernian Anti-Slavery Society uh, main figures. He's also a publisher, that's really important. And um, when Douglas is in Ireland, he organizes the printing of an Irish edition of the Frederick Douglass uh, memoir. They print 2,000 copies in 1845, and they're very quickly bought up as Douglas tours around the island of Ireland. And brilliantly, he actually writes to Webb from Belfast in December 1845, saying, I want more, I want more. They're all gone, all 2,000 copies are gone. They're incredibly rare uh, today. One thing about Webb that Douglas really likes is that he talks to him as an equal. Uh, very much annoyed Frederick Douglas, often that you know white abolitionists, when they were talking to him, would agree with everything he said to his face and criticize it behind his back. He really felt when he was talking with Richard D. Webb, he was talking to an equal. It's been noted that he was brave enough to disagree that should be with Douglas to his face. Uh, I think he really respected that, and he felt confident even to debate with him. Uh, they fell out briefly over what the book should look like when Frederick Douglass printed a second edition, uh, a second Irish edition of his memoir. He wanted to include words from Isaac N Nelson and Thomas Drew, two Belfast Presbyterian ministers. Webb said, I'm not sure how wise that is, you know, when, when we're flogging the book across the rest of the island of Ireland, uh, but Douglas insisted on it, and they ended up in there in the end. What a Frederick Douglass lecture looks like uh, it's not just a man standing on a platform speaking. Lawrence Fenton, who's written about Douglas's speaking tour, he talks about how he uh, was well able to capture the attention of an audience. You know, he lifted up a whip, some manacles, and other instrumentals of torture used in the slave states, 
rattling them before a gas-filled hall. Douglas had carried them across the Atlantic, packed away in the same suitcase as his shirts and trousers. They would certainly have made an interesting sight for an inquisitive customs official. But this was a lecture, you know, unlike anything uh, most audiences in Dublin, Waterford, or here in Belfast would have heard before. And remember, Charles Lennox Remond, who was here before uh, Douglas, was a free man. Uh, though he was a black man, he was a free man. Douglas was talking to the audience with the you know, distinct personal experience of having been a slave. He hears Daniel O'Connell uh, early on while in Dublin on the 29th of September, 1845. Uh, I have heard many speakers within the last four years, speakers of the first order, but I confess I've never heard one by whom I was more captivated than by Mr. Uh, O'Connell. This meeting is important. It's the only time they share a stage together. There's a really strong mythology around Douglas uh, and O'Connell. One part of that mythology is that O'Connell brings him up to the stage and tells the crowd in Dublin, apparently, this, my friends, is the black Daniel O'Connell and they all cheer. O'Connell doesn't do that. Uh, Douglas himself references the black O'Connell. He tells the crowd in Dublin, the poor trampled slave of Carolina had heard the name of the liberator with joy and hope. And he himself, this is a newspaper report, had heard the wish that some black O'Connell would yet rise up amongst his countrymen and cry, agitate, agitate, agitate. He's really shocked by Dublin, O'Connell, uh, Douglas, uh, the poverty of the city. But Dublin is not a great industrial city uh, in the 19th century, you know, far from it, uh, you know, especially in comparison with Linenopolis or, or, or Belfast, Dublin is a city that's defined by an absence of industry in the 19th century. Uh, and the impression that that makes on Douglas is very strong. He talks about the streets were literally alive with beggars, displaying the greatest wretchedness. Uh, during my stay in Dublin, I took occasion to visit the huts of the poor and of all the places to witness human misery, I misery, ignorance, degradation, filth and wretchedness, an Irish hut is preeminent. The immediate, and it may be the main cause of the extreme poverty and beggary in Dublin, he writes home to William Lloyd Garrison, is intemperance. This may be seen in the fact that most beggars drink whiskey. Drunkenness is still rife in Ireland. The temperance cause has done much and is doing much, but there's much more to do, and as yet, comparatively few to do it. The crossover between people in America that were involved in abolition, anti-slavery politics, and temperance politics was enormous. Both Douglas and William Lloyd Garrison were very staunch on the issue uh, of temperance. And that was a movement that Douglas was very taken by uh, when he sees it firsthand in 19th century Ireland, the, the movement of Father Theobald Matthew, a poster from a few years earlier of 90,000 teetotalers on St. Patrick's Day of all days. Can you imagine it? Not a great day for the temperance movement anymore. He meets Father Matthew, Father Theobald Matthew in Cork. Uh, Father Theobald Matthew, of course, had convinced millions of us to take the pledge and to give up drink. And Douglas was really taken by this crusade. Uh, his whole soul appeared to be wrapped up in the temperance cause. His time, strength and money are all freely given to the cause. His success is truly wonderful. And despite the fact that he's not a Catholic himself, Douglas actually takes the pledge from Father Theobald Matthew. Uh, I reckon myself with the light, he says, the fifth of the last of Father Matthew's 5,487,495 temperance children. It's Father Matthew's monument uh, in Cork. The anti-temperance rebels have little regard for it, unfortunately. Uh, that wasn't the link that lasted. In, uh, a lot of the links that Frederick Douglass made in Ireland uh, proved to be lasting personal links. We'd often meet these people when they were in the United States. Uh, even, as we'll hear later, returned to Ireland uh, in a personal capacity uh, on holidays later in his life. Father Matthew was a, a link that kind of fell apart. Uh, he was so impressed by his movement when he saw it in Ireland. But when Father Matthew went to America a few short years later, he left Douglas down, to say the least. He visited 25 states. Uh, in 300 cities. He made an address to the House of Representatives. But when Douglas and others asked Father Matthew to publicly denounce slavery in America, uh, he refused to do it. And Father Matthew said, I have as much 
as I can do to save men from the slavery of intemperance without attempting the overthrow of any other kind of slave. And Douglas was, to say the least, not impressed. Nothing reveals more completely the all-prevailing presence of slavery in this land than the sad fact that scarcely a single foreigner who ventures on our soil is found able to withstand uh, its influence. We had fondly hoped from an acquaintance with Father Matthew that his would be a better fate, that he would not change his morality by changing his location. Isn't that a brilliant line? Uh, we are, however, grieved, humbled, and mortified to know that he, too, has fallen. So for all his admiration for Father Matthew and the uh, anti-drink crusade uh, in Ireland, in the United States, a few years later, Douglas thought less of Father Matthew. It's really interesting how Douglas changes the message, uh, depending on where he is, as he tours across the island of Ireland. And I thought that's what uh, any good speaking tour is about. You know, De Valera was like that in the States in 1990 and 1920. Depending where you are, you adjust what you say uh, accordingly. So in Cork, Douglas will stand on a platform and he'll praise Father Matthew and he'll talk of the Temperance Crusade. Uh, in Dublin, you know, he talks about O'Connell, repeal, all of that. Uh, and in Belfast, he's primarily hosted by religious organizations, and you see that in the speeches that he gives here. So in the Presbyterian Church on Rosemary Street, the creator has, had given the slave moral and intellectual faculties, religious aspirations, but the slaveholder stepped in and forbade their ex exercise. Now the question which he had more particularly to consider was, did the Book of God sanction such an atrocious system? Then look to the laws as delivered on the mount for an answer, Thou shalt not steal was a command which dealt death to the principle that slavery was a divine institution. So wherever O'Connell is speaking, uh, the message, I suppose, is suited to that particular uh, audience. There's not a single, uh, wherever Douglas is speaking, sorry, there's not a particular Douglas speech that's given in every single location. When he leaves Ireland after the first four months, he writes back to William Lloyd Garrison. I'm now about to take leave of the Emerald Isle for Glasgow. I've been here a little more than four months. I can truly say I've spent some of the happiest moments of my life since landing in this country. I seem to have undergone a transformation. I live a new life. The entire absence of everything that looked like prejudice against me on account of the color of my skin contrasted so strongly with my long and bitter experience in the United States that I look with wonder and amazement on the transition. And Christine Keneally, the great historian of the abolitionist movement, she really highlights those words and just how important they are. This idea that there had been a kind of personal transformation uh, within Frederick Douglass, that he felt he owed his political awakening, if you will, to the reception he received on the island of Ireland. And it is remarkable that he comes back so soon after saying that, you know, that he departs for Scotland, but he is quickly back speaking in Belfast uh, within a matter of weeks. There's something that lures him back to the island of Ireland. It would be wrong to, I suppose, present it that every nationalist voice uh, in Ireland was welcoming towards Frederick Douglass. That wasn't the case. Uh, the Nation, the newspaper of the Young Irelanders, a movement that had split uh, from Daniel O'Connell in the 1840s. Uh, interestingly, one of the only papers in Dublin that doesn't cover any of Frederick Douglass's speaking engagements in the city, but that does print uh, remarkable, remarkable ignorant things to read in, in, in retrospect. We have really so very urgent affairs at home, their readers were told, that all our exertions will be needed in Ireland. Carolina planters never devoured our substance, nor drove away our sheep and oxen for a spoil. Our enemies are nearer home than Carolina. And I think there was a bitterness within the nation, the nationalist newspaper, towards Daniel O'Connell, kind of playing the role of an international statesman, talking about things like slavery, uh, which they felt were not exactly pressing issues in an Irish context. John Mitchell uh, of the Young Irelanders insisted that the men of the Southern states must not have their institutions interfered with. This was not a question they maintained that Irish people should be engaging with. So what of Frederick Douglass after his time in Ireland, Douglas becomes, it's sometimes said, the most photographed man in 19th century America. Uh, he 
famously opposed the idea of what, what he called the smiling Negro, you know, of playing a particular role before the camera. He always presented himself as a very serious uh, political figure in these portraits. Uh, and he became a household name in the United States in the aftermath of these speaking tour engagements on this side of the world. When he returns to the US, he begins editing almost immediately his own newspaper, The North Star. And he's more and more confident, I think it's worth saying, in his own ability uh, to lead the fight. Now, that's not an insult to William Lloyd Garrison. He still has great respect for William Lloyd Garrison and, and white abolitionists. But I think he has a, a new confidence in his own ability, if you will, to lead the fight, or that black people themselves more broadly can lead the fight. Uh, the North Star is a fantastic newspaper. I love its banner head. Right is of no sex. Truth is of no color. God is the father of us all, and we are all brethren. He strongly advocated for the right of black soldiers to fight in the American Civil War uh, and to equal treatment. Uh, he advocated for the rights of former slaves post-emancipation proclamation. One aspect of his life that I think is often overlooked, but which is very, very important, he was a committed supporter of women's rights and a supporter of, I say, suffrage movements, rather than the suffrage movement, because it was a, like the abolition movement had been, it was a very split movement. But O'Connell believed that those who stood for abolition of slavery should support the rights of women in society and the rights of women to vote. And he was very strong uh, on that issue. In fact, uh, when O'Connell, I'm uh, sorry, when Douglas, when Douglas passes, his last speaking engagement was at a suffrage meeting. Only three years after his visit to Ireland, he wrote an incredible letter to his former master, which has all the power of his memoir years earlier. I will now bring this letter to a close. You shall hear from me again. Uh, you shall hear from me again unless you let me hear from you. I intend to make use of you as a weapon with which to assail the system of slavery, as a means of concentrating public attention on the system and deepening their horror of trafficking in the souls and bodies of men. I shall make use of you as a means of exposing the character of the American church and clergy, and a means of bringing this guilty nation with yourself to, rep to re repentance. In doing this, I entertain no malice towards you personally. There's no roof under which you will be more safe than mine, and there's nothing in my house which you might need for your comfort, which I would not readily grant. Indeed, I should esteem it a privilege to set you an example as to how mankind ought to treat each other. I am your fellow man, but not your slave, Frederick Douglass. There's a great confidence uh, in Douglass in those years immediately after that speaking tour here. He returned to Ireland, interestingly, in 1887. Uh, little known visit, little studied visit. He reconnected with some of those who were central to the 1840s visit. Now, a lot of them are dead. Douglass was very young. When he spoke here in the 1840s, uh, you know, often 20, 30 years younger than the people in the Hibernian Anti-Slavery Society. But in the 1880s, he arrives back in Ireland and he lodges with some of their children, uh, in some cases, uh, grandchildren and one or two survivors of that time that are still on the on the political scene. Now, he's not necessarily on a, a, a lecturing tour. Uh, he's here as but more in a personal capacity. But it's an interesting time to be in Ireland in the 1880s. You know, the political atmosphere was very, very shaped by home rule and the home rule question. When he returned to Ireland, when he returned to the States in the aftermath uh, of this 1887 visit to Ireland, he did speak about his admiration for Prime Minister Gladstone uh, on a platform in the United States in 1887. And what he said is interesting. He drew on his memory of the 1840s visit to Ireland. You can really tell just how much it meant to him. More than 40 years ago, I had the pleasure and the privilege of standing on the banks of the Liffey, side by side with the great O'Connell. And at that time, I declared before a vast audience uh, my conviction, the justice, the wisdom, the necessity, and the final triumph of the repeal of the Union. I heard something of the breadth and comprehensiveness of the Irish heart from that great and good man. And I am, therefore, with every other American, whatever colour or class, an out and out home ruler, and an out and out home ruler for every man in this republic i.e. the United States. So he retained that fondness, I suppose, of, and that deep memory of the importance personally of the visit of the 1840s, and he drew on it even decades later. Other abolitionists passed through uh, Ireland 
in the years that followed, Sarah Parker Remond, uh, sister of Charles Remond, who had been here just before uh, the, uh, Frederick Douglass. Really interesting, I suppose, to have a woman delivering the message uh, in, in Dublin in the 1850s. As the newspaper reported, the audience were accustomed in this country to hear lectures on public subjects delivered by men only. But this was a great moral question. Miss Remond had identified herself with it and had made it her own. And it was a source of tremendous pride to Frederick Douglass that women in time were on the platform uh, of speaking internationally and denouncing racism uh, in the United States. In time, there were other interactions between Ireland and Black America, sometimes surprising ones. Uh, Marcus Garvey, the Pan-African leader in the early 20th century, uh, his headquarters in Harlem was named Liberty Hall in honor of Liberty Hall of Jim Larkin and James Connolly uh, in Dublin. But he very much drew his inspiration, uh, not from O'Connell, but from a different Irish political tradition, you know, saying famously on one occasion that the day was coming when the Negro race would find, as he said, his own, its own Robert Emmett's uh, and Roger Casements. But interactions between Black America and the Irish question did continue subsequently into the 20th century. Earlier this year, we unveiled a new plaque in Dublin uh, in honour of one of those lectures given by Frederick Douglass, which was at the Society of Friends Meeting Hall, the home for Quakers uh, in Temple Bar. And it's been really inspiring in recent years to see the erection of more and more plaques like this across the island of Ireland. And I gather that Belfast uh, is going one better with the erection of a statue to Frederick Douglass. I think in a city where he received undoubtedly the warmest welcome and the most diverse welcome, uh, that would be a very fitting tribute. But it is an extraordinary story in the history of so many cities and towns that Douglas passed through across the island of Ireland. So thank you very much uh, for listening to that.